when I tell the software to fit these models on top, this specific model on top of my data, as we can see here in blue, the historical data is very volatile. It goes from 600 to three times that, comes back and it, it's highly volatile. So the future can also be very uncertain. But all in all, more or less the average of this process is about 1,000. If you look at the data, every time the, the, the prices are below 1,000, it tends to go up eventually. Every time it's above 1,000, it tends to crash back, sometimes violently, back to the 800, 1,200 range. So somewhere around 1,000 is where the volatility tends to be smaller. And outside of this 1,000 range, let's say 1,000 plus minus 100 or something around this, outside of this comfort zone, volatilities tend to be a lot higher, more violent. That's evidence of mean revert. There is a, an equilibrium level somewhere and prices tend to revert to this equilibrium level. Uh, the bad news is that sometimes the equilibrium level changes over time, of course, because it's the long-term expectation of the industry. But it's a very intuitive model to use for commodities because of this. We can maybe discuss what the equilibrium level is for the short-term future, for the long-term future, and even include that in the model. What we see here in red are possible paths that we can see from this commodity in the future, based on simulation, of course. Out of these thousands of possible uh, uh, paths or behaviors that the, the variable can exhibit, you have an average, and the average will be around 1,000. You have a confidence interval, 50% confidence interval, and 90%. So 90% of the time, according to this model, the, the, the price will be around 700 up to 100, 1,300, 1,250, something like that. Okay, 90% of the time we should observe prices around here. <clears throat> but based on current prices, tomorrow's price might be a lot higher. If you think in terms of like one week from now, prices may be a lot higher, a lot lower. This reversion to, to the $1,000 mean is a slow thing. And it's a slow thing that actually depends on the level of the variable. If it's too far away, it tends to be brutal, this return. But it's not immediate. The variable may stay you know, away from the average for maybe years until it comes back. It's one of the parameters of the model. So if you wanted to model prices like this, we could easily do that and then just throw this in, in, in Excel and get our model going. Okay? But we're interested in more than that. We're interested in modeling the three commodities simultaneously, right? Then there are some choices we have to make here, which will reflect the quality of our model at the end. For example, should I model the three series directly? If I do that, and I can do that with the trees, the trees will find for me not only the best possible model for each, but also the correlation structure between them. The problem is sometimes this correlation structure, even though it's very strong, it's not enough to connect the series the way we, we believe they behave. Sometimes the correlation structure, even though it's very strong, 95, 99%, it modeling series directly might still create situations where the prices diverge in the future. Okay, that's one of the pitfalls that we often face with, with, with type series. We so have a tool, we apply the tool, everything is based on the tool. But when you simulate and create scenarios in the future, you end up sometimes with things that are not exactly as you expected or not as realistic as they could be. One thing we can do to improve the quality of type series models when we have multiple series like this. And we're still going to use the correlation, but one thing we can do, instead of modeling the series directly, let's take a look at the spreads, okay? So, uh, for example, I, I could model one time series for, for soybeans and another complicated time series with volatility, trends, seasonality, blah, 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 for the soybean meal. I have two complicated models, okay? But what if I tell you that you know, looking at historical data, soybean meal prices are 30% of soybean prices. 30%. It does not vary over time. It's always 30%. Maybe 27, 28, 30, maybe 31, 32%. Always around 30%. It's never been higher than 35, never been lower than 25%. Always around 30%. It's almost like a triangular distribution, almost like the, 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 the price here of, of the uh, his triangle of the soybean is something like this 0 0.25, 1, 2, 3, 
0.35 so triangular distribution around Fabian price what if I tell you that this model is very accurate you know saying that you know prices of of, of uh, so I've been a roughly 30 as you can see here I'm not lying it's actually around very close to 30 percent of what the the, the soybean prices are what if this is a good model? Of course, it might be a little bit higher or lower over time, so you may create a distribution here. What if this makes sense? It's one of the things you should always test when you're bidding uh, commodity prices, whether we should model the series directly or when you have a group of interrelated commodities, whether it makes more sense to model one base commodity, the probably the, the, the most liquid one or the most the best one to model, and spreads. And the spread can either be, instead of directly the price, the, the spread can either be a difference. So here I'm calculating just the difference between the prices. Okay? Or the spread can be a percentage, like a relative uh, uh, distance between the prices. When you look at these three alternatives, how could I model my soybean meal prices on top of soybean prices? When you look at these three alternatives, an absolute model, a nominal margin or difference or a percentage difference between them one very interesting thing that you will see is that if you calculate the correlation one of the models one of the theories is almost uncorrelated with soybean prices so the correlation between this percentage spread and the base commodity is very small which means they're roughly independent which means I have a, a, a series here that whose average is 30%. It can be as low as 25, as high as 40% according to Excel. So the worst case scenario, this margin was 40% or 25%, not very far from 30. As you can see, the, 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 the maximum is like 30% more. The minimum is like 10, 15% less. It's a very stable series. And that describes how soybean meal prices behave around the base commodity. This is way easier for us to model. You get a much more accurate model. You're modeling almost like a, a deterministic variable. Just say that, you know, this price is 30% of the base commodity and you have a good model. Add to that the time series to model this slight volatility around 30%, you have an even better model. So these are ways you can create an even more realistic model. And when you create your forecast model, you will link those two in a more uh, uh, realistic way. Okay? Just taking a look at the graphs, remember the scatter plots we had here, for example, for um, soybean meal prices and uh, soybean prices. Now, if you look at